Welcome to our channel. In this video we will review some facts about the most popular folktales from around the world. But before we start, please like this video and subscribe to our channel for future updates. There is something about popular folktales that has captivated audiences for generations. There is nothing new in folktales, whether orally passed down or written down by an author, that we have not heard before. Folktales are traditional stories meant to help individuals develop a good moral compass. Learning about the many folktales and the teachings they provide has molded virtues in youngsters even after they have grown into adults. Many popular folktales from throughout the world have gone far beyond their roots, thanks to the rise of the internet, print media, and technological advancements. Lessons learned from each folktale shape the upbringing of society's children, making it even more fascinating to learn. All of the old folktales that individuals grew up with can have a significant impact on society. Folklore, on the other hand, is not the same as folktales. While fairy tales and fables are forms of folktales, cultural heritage developed folklore stories, which frequently include frightening legends. Folklore includes supernatural being cautions to keep children safe or well behaved. Some folklore is also utilized to celebrate cultural heritage, and there are always lessons to be learned from it. While you may be familiar with your own country's folktales and typical fairy tales, there are many popular folktales to learn about. We have gathered a large collection of fairy tales and folktales for you to read and enjoy. This page discusses their origins, important authors who composed them or printed the oral story, and the deeper significance behind them. Section I, Table of Contents. The Origins of Folktales. Folktales are defined as stories that are primarily, but not exclusively, aimed at youngsters. Folktales are classified into three types, fables, fairy tales, and folktales. Folktales and mythical creatures or supernatural events are combined in old fairy tales. They frequently describe a magical otherworld concealed from our own. Fables are stories about animals who experience human difficulties and learn moral lessons that can be applied in everyday life. Finally, folktales are stories passed down from one generation to the next. Famous folktales are either kid-friendly or frightening, with horrible endings. Folktales existed long before paper was invented. The stories were frequently told orally. It is unclear how old the custom of telling stories is. Authors began writing about fictitious places and creatures after they learned how to mass-produce books and send them to numerous locations. These are known as fairy tales. Folk tales and fables are both centuries old. They evolved into a subgenre of folk tales geared at animal characters confronted with dilemmas and conflicts that people frequently experience. Different artists recreate popular folk tales and make them their own, resulting in constantly shifting renditions. Most popular folk tales according to location. Now that we've established the many categories of folk tales, let's look at some of the most popular folk tales in their native countries. We took the time to organize them by continent to make it easier to navigate. This article also includes their origin country, noteworthy authors and genuine writers of their stories, and the purpose behind all of these folk tales. Folk tales from Europe. Fables of Aesop. Aesop the slave wrote it. Greece and Sumer are the locations. Aesop's Fables is the most well-known collection of fables. They are one of the most popular folk tales and one of the oldest examples of a folk tale passed down orally. Aesop's fables employed animism to tell stories with moral and virtue lessons. Animism is a type of narrative in which the main characters are animals who encounter situations and difficulties that humans face. Since the 6th century BCE, nearly 700 fables have been passed down orally. These fables are more notably associated with ancient Greece. The fables, on the other hand, are akin to Sumerian proverbs. Despite the fact that the stories have been warped through time due to a lack of recorded texts, the stories stay faithful to the values on which each fable was based. A fascinating truth about these tales is that no one knows for certain whether Aesop, the slave who was credited with penning all of them, ever lived. Riding Hood, Little Red Riding Hood. Authors of note include the brothers Grimm and Charles Perrault. Locations include France and Italy. Old fairy tales, such as The Little Red Riding Hood, also known as The Little Red Cap, had multiple interpretations and versions. Popular folk tales like this one were originally passed down orally. However, famous authors such as Wolfgang von Goethe, the brothers Grimm, and Robert Browning published them. In some versions of the story, Little Red Riding Hood dies in the arms of the wolf, like in Charles Perrault's. In other stories, the wolf transforms into a werewolf or an ogre. 
the concept of the huntsman, who frees the wolf's victims and has the small girl load him with heavy pebbles, was introduced by the Grimm brothers. For decades, people have debated the moral of the Little Red Riding Hood. Some claim it's the story of a girl becoming a woman through her first menstruation. Others believe it is about sexual predators. The most famous moral lesson in this story, though, is to avoid strangers and be cautious while venturing out alone. One interesting aspect about this narrative is that the small girl was named Blanchett by one of the authors, Charles Morell. Andrew Lang, a more modern author, replaced the red hood with a gold one. In his version, the enchanted golden hood burned the wolf from the inside out. Hamlin's Pied Piper. Authors of note include Wolfgang van Goethe, Brothers Grimm, and Robert Browning. Germany is the location. The Pied Piper of Hamelin is one of the most precisely pinpointed folktales on this list due to ideas about its origins. Around the Middle Ages, people began telling this story. It takes set in Hamelin, Germany, amid a terrible rat infestation that caused massive issues for the town's residents. The mayor of Hamelin encounters a mysterious man dressed in fancy clothes who claims to be able to fix the town's situation. The Pied Piper informs the mayor that all he requires in exchange is 1,000 guilders. The Pied Piper used his pipe to entice the rats to drown in a big body of water. The mayor, on the other hand, got avaricious and refused to pay the Pied Piper what the municipality owed him. In retaliation, the Pied Piper kidnapped the children of Hamlin. Wolfgang von Goethe, the brothers Grimm, and Robert Browning all wrote famous renditions of the Pied Piper. The majority of the stories finish with varied outcomes for the youngsters. Some works depict the children drowning, being led into a dark tunnel, or going missing. While the moral of the narrative is to follow your vows, the underlying questions surrounding the children's outcomes spawned numerous perspectives. Some say the children died during an epidemic brought in by the rats that Pied Piper killed as well, making him an embodiment of death. Other theorists believe that Pied Piper led the residents of Hamlin out from the town, not only the children. The last well-known notion is that the children were abducted to become child soldiers. The Three Bears and Goldilocks Authors of note include Robert Southey and Joseph Cundall. Location, United Kingdom. Goldilocks and the Three Bears, like the other popular English fairy tales in this page, had a different title than the one we know today. It was originally titled The Three Bears, but Goldilocks was added in later versions. The true story is about an elderly lady who forcefully enters the home of three male bears. She flees after being awakened by the bears, just as Goldilocks did. In some renditions, these bears have been combined to form a family unit, Papa Bear, Mama Bear, and Baby Bear. The moral of Goldilocks and the Three Bears is to respect others' privacy and things. It's an excellent story to teach children about not invading another person's private property. However, Robert Southey's classic retelling of this folktale emphasizes the importance of exercising prudence when embarking on various adventures. Being cautious about where you travel and anticipating potential dangers is the best method to protect your safety and survival. Notable Chicken Little Brothers Grimm and Just Matthias Thieler are the authors. Locations include Denmark and Germany. Popular folktales, such as Chicken Little, have undergone major alterations in the years since they were first told. It was originally titled Henny Penny. It now goes by the names Chicken Little and Chicken Licken. Before authors began publishing the story, it was an old folktale told throughout Europe. Just Matthias Thieler was a Scandinavian novelist who wrote Henny Penny in 1823 and published it in Danish. Chicken Little was also written by the Brothers Grimm. The English rendition of the folktale was then written about by Benjamin Thorpe. Following him were several variants resulting from mistranslations and a variety of artistic styles. Whatever the case, the lesson remained the same. After an acorn lands on his head, a chicken becomes sure that the sky is collapsing. In some versions, the chicken and its friends attempt to meet the king and come across a wicked fox attempting to consume them. Regardless of the alterations, the moral of Chicken Little remains the same. Do not incite public frenzy or jump to conclusions. Instead, it could be more risky for you. Ariel from The Little Mermaid. Hans Christian Andersen is the author. Denmark is the location. While the tiny mermaid had no name in the original form, her narrative became one of the most popular children's folktales about unconditional love. Hans Christian Andersen of Denmark is the original author of The Little Mermaid. Hans is a well-known children's novelist well known for his fairy tale novels. However, in his original story, Ariel did not have a happy ending. 
Undines, water elemental spirits mentioned in Paracelsus books, impacted Hans Christian Andersen as he was composing, The Little Mermaid. The Little Mermaid and the Prince do not fall in love in his tale. Instead, the prince falls in love with a neighboring princess, who loves him back. It's also considerably different from Disney's version, since the titular mermaid transforms into seafoam after refusing to kill the prince in order to reclaim her fins. While everyone feared she was doomed, the little mermaid ends up becoming a daughter of the air. The daughters of air inform her that in order to receive her immortal soul, she needs perform 300 years of good deeds. She might accomplish this by blessing children and doing good for humanity. The Awful Duckling. Hans Christian Andersen is the author. Denmark is the location. The Ugly Duckling was also written by Hans Christian Andersen. The narrative, like Aesop's fables, employs animism and teaches a vital lesson that most of us have yet to learn. In contrast to The Little Mermaid's actions and consequences, The Ugly Duckling is a fable. Unlike the previous Anderson story, The Ugly Duckling tells us that the only way to become who we are intended to be is to accept all of our defects. The story is famous for its emotional ending, in which the ugly duckling transforms into a gorgeous swan after eventually opting to live in the outer world rather than feeling ashamed by others' words. Surprisingly, it is one of the few folk tales with minor alterations in different forms. The hardships that the titular duckling endures, such as being pushed away continually by other species, cause the alterations. There are numerous hypotheses as to what inspired Anderson's writing. Some claim it was because he was teased as a child, while others believe it was because he discovered his true parentage. He was said to be an illegitimate offspring of the royal family. His father was said to be King Christian III of Denmark. Bluebeard, Snotable Charles Perrault is the author. France is the location. Charles Perrault, a well-known author, was the first to publish Bluebeard. It was, however, orally transmitted with influences from two historical figures, Gilles de Ray and Connemore the Accursed. Bluebeard's story is one of the most violent popular folk tales ever told. It all starts with Bluebeard being famous for constantly remarrying and having his women disappear without a trace. Bluebeard gave his most recent wife the key to all of his belongings and instructed her not to open one specific door. However, at a party she was throwing, the wife's curiosity got the best of her and she entered the prohibited area, revealing the massacred bodies of the past wives. The key is magical, and it is smeared with blood that cannot be removed. Bluebeard nearly killed his most recent wife, who was saved by her in-laws. They murdered her, and she inherited his fortune. There are several questions about Bluebeard's moral lesson. They normally go over three main points. The first is about their wives' obedience to their husbands. The last two are about the key Bluebeard gives to his wife. Because of its magic, the key-stained blood could no longer be clean. According to researchers, this could indicate Bluebeard's awareness of wrongdoing. A secret that, once revealed to the young bride, could permanently ruin their relationship. Others think that it represents the male sexual organ and what happens when it breaks a woman's hymen. That is, permanent harm has been done to both the wife and their marriage. Some argue that the damage is adultery because Bluebeard was not present when the key became bloodstained. Jack and the Beanstalk. J. Roberts, Benjamin Tabart, and Andrew Lang are notable authors. England is the location. Jack and the Beanstalk is one of the popular folk tales that were published as a fairy tale. According to researchers, the origins of the Jack and the Beanstalk folk story can be traced back to Proto-Indo-European and Proto-Indo-Iranian forms. Around the year 1734, it was first published in Round About Our Coal Fire as The Story of Jack Higgins and the Enchanted Bean. According to many versions of the story, the giant's name is Blunderbore, which is based on Jack the Giant Killer although the original name of the giant in The Story of Jack Higgins and the Enchanted Bean is Gogmagog. Jack and the Beanstalk opens with Jack selling his family's cow in exchange for enchanted beans. Jack sows the beans in their field, and they grow into a tall stalk. He scales the stalk and encounters a scary behemoth. Fee-fi-fo-fum, I smell the blood of an Englishman, be he living or dead, I'll grind his bones to make my bread, the giant says aloud. However, Jack outwits the giant and steals his golden egg-laying geese, his magical harp that plays itself, and a bag of gold. When the giant tries to collect his stolen stuff, Jack cuts off the stork, killing him. Making it possible for Jack's family to succeed. In Tabart's version, a fairy tells Jack that the giant murdered and robbed his own father, moralizing his actions. Folk Tales from Asia. The Zodiac Legend. Unknown author, Han Dynasty. China is the location. 
The Zodiac Animal Story is an excellent addition to this list of popular folk tales. The Chinese Zodiac's true author is unknown. However, historians have traced it back to the Han Dynasty. Since its inception, different variations have spread throughout Asia. This story has been told in Cambodian, Thai, Japanese, Vietnamese, and South Korean dialects. As a basic folktale, the animals reflect a 12-year cycle. The animals that represent the signs include the rat, ox, tiger, rabbit, dragon, snake, horse, goat, monkey, rooster, dog, and pig. The myth opens with the Jade Emperor, often known as the first god, declaring a race to determine which animals represent which year. Even in the adult world, the story might be relatable. The rat got in first by exploiting its disadvantages. It was, however, willing to step on others in order to advance. Despite his efforts, the bull came in second place. After eating and napping, the pig was the last to complete. It's a narrative about the various personalities that may be found in people, as well as which attributes to admire and which to avoid. Isan Boshi. Muromachi period, unknown author, Otajizoshi. Japan is the location. Isan Boshi is a Muromachi folktale from the Otajizoshi, a collection of popular folktales published as an illustrated book. The story, however, outlives the Otajizoshi. One Sun Boy is the literal translation of the words Isan Boshi. It follows the narrative of Isan Boshi, a youngster who never grew higher than three centimeters. His parents were an elderly couple who begged to the gods to give them a child. Isan Boshi decides to travel to become a warrior one day. He makes a sword out of a needle, a boat out of a bowl, and a rowing pole out of a chopstick. According to many versions of the story, he married a girl and obtained a magical hammer that made him six feet tall. According to some versions of the Isan Boshi myth, he duped the girl into marriage by sprinkling rice on her lips and pretending it was his stock. In some versions, he saves the girl from an oni, who eventually surrenders after being poked from the interior of his stomach by Isan Boshi. In any case, he obtains a magical hammer, which the oni abandons, and becomes a wealthy man while marrying the girl of his dreams. The narrative is comparable to another legend in which a huge character is defeated by a smaller one. This is to place an emphasis on intelligence, wit, and adaptability over physical strength. The Japanese enjoy David and Goliath stories and value wisdom and humility. The Turtle and the Monkey. Jose P. Rizal wrote it. Philippines is the location. The Monkey and the Turtle is a classic folktale by Jose P. Rizal, a Philippine national hero. It is also one of the country's most popular folktales. The monkey and the turtle were great friends in this fable who came found a giant banana leaf floating along the water. The two broke the leaf in half, with the monkey taking the top half and the turtle taking the bottom. After a while, the turtle's part blossomed into a banana tree, but the monkey's portion was devoured. The turtle had faith in the monkey to assist him in obtaining the bananas that had blossomed at the top of its tree. The monkey, on the other hand, betrayed him. The turtle killed the monkey out of revenge, then fled a sophisticated plot devised by the monkey's companions. The moral of this story is to never deceive your friends and to never deprive others of their rights. Greed will only bring a person's ruin. Meanwhile, those plotting vengeance on the turtle erred by being too quick to rage. The novel was greatly influenced by the oppression of Filipinos under Spanish control. The monkey represented the powerful Spaniards, and the Filipinos resembled the turtle who tried their best with what they had. The Four Dragons. Unknown author. China is the location. The Four Dragons is the work of an unknown Chinese author. It is a popular folktale regarding the formation of the country's four big rivers. According to the legend, four dragons saw that humanity were thirsty for water. Concerned about their situation, the dragons approached the Jade Emperor, who did nothing. Despite the fact that they would eventually be imprisoned, the four dragons rained raindrops for the people. They then transformed into rivers, splitting the ground and providing more water to people. While the story ended with the dragon's terrible deaths, it nonetheless promised hope and goodness. Despite the risk of being punished by a highly esteemed individual, the dragons did the right thing. Heilongjiang, Zhu Jiang, Huang'e, and Chang Jiang are the names of the dragons in the story. Kemung, Princess. Unknown author. Benkulu, Indonesia is the location. Princess Kemung, commonly known as Putri Kemung, is a courageous young princess who enjoys hunting. She kills a deer and meets a Kemung tree that resembles a lovely young man. She would like to be his friend. 
Unfortunately, she must overcome a number of challenges in order to ensure that the Kemung tree can be safely uprooted and transformed into a human. After a year, she reunites with the Kemung tree, who has now become the forest's prince. The moral of the story is that women should aggressively pursue their own life choices rather than waiting for others to make them for them. Indonesian folktales rarely have such an active princess selecting her own fate. Most folktales depict women acting humbly, tenderly, and even obediently. This is why, in recent years, the story of Princess Kemung has become a notable folktale. The Book of 1001 Nights. Writers, several authors. Middle Eastern Region. 1001 Nights is one of the most well-known collections of folktales ever published. During the Islamic Golden Age, it was created. The stories in the collection date back to Arabic, Egyptian, Mesopotamian, Indian, and Persian times. Many popular folktales are included in this book, including Aladdin's Wonderful Lamp, The Seven Voyages of Sinbad the Sailor, and Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves, all of which were added later and weren't included in earlier editions of the novel. 1001 Nights stories are set in a narrative within a story. King Sharia is heartbroken at his wife's infidelity. When the morning after comes, he has her killed as retribution and continues to kill all of his subsequent wives. Scheherazade volunteers when there are no more virgins to sacrifice to the enraged king. Every night, she starts telling him a story without finishing it and then moves on to the next. According to the compilation, this practice takes place over the course of 1001 nights, hence the moniker. Each of these stories has a different moral message to teach those who are listening. However, you should not read all of them to a youngster under the age of 18. Horror and sexual innuendos are among them. Neko Maneki. Unknown author. Gotoku Ji Temple is located in Japan. Maneki Neko is one of Japan's most beloved folktales. It's the story of Japan's famed beckoning cat. The Maneki Neko sculpture is considered to bring wealth and good luck. It depicts a white or golden cat with one of its arms waving forward and backward as if urging you to approach it. The author of this story is unknown. The origins of the story, however, have been attributed to either Kyoto or Tokyo. Nautaka was a wealthy lord samurai from the Hikone Domain District. He was on his way to hunt when it began to rain. Nautaka takes refuge in a nearby shrine. This shrine was looked after by a poor monk who had a calico cat. The cat invited Nautaka to come closer during the storm. A bolt of lightning struck down the tree he was seeking shelter in as he followed his curiosity and walked towards the cat. Nautaka became a temple patron after becoming extremely grateful for the cat. This enabled the temple to thrive. Another version of the folktale portrays a poor shopkeeper who decides to care for a stray cat despite his financial situation. The cat subsequently began beckoning clients into the store, providing the shopkeeper an opportunity to improve his financial situation. By Champa Sart. Dakshinaranjan Mitra Majumda is a notable author. Bengal is the location. The Sart by Champa is a popular Bengali folktale. It was initially published in Dakshinaranjan Mitra Majumda's book, Thakumar Juli, in 1907. The story has received enough attention to warrant multiple film adaptations. The first was created in Bangladesh, and the second in West Bengal, India. There is even a famous artwork of Sart by Champa Gaganendranath Tagore in the Calcutta Academy of Fine Arts. The story begins with a king and his seven wives. Unfortunately for the monarch, none of his wives were able to bear children. The monarch was depressed, and he frequently spent time alone in the forest. A priest from the jungle, moved by the king's plight, delivers the king mangoes producing fruit. He then offered the fruit to three of his wives to consume. Only one queen, the youngest, had octuplets. There were seven boys and one small girl in the group. However, the elder queens who ate the fruit with skepticism became envious. The seven boys were buried in the garden, where they flowered into seven champak flowers and one trumpet flower. One last female managed to escape after being kidnapped in secret by a loyal maid. She became an important piece of the attempt to resurrect her brothers after discovering her true parentage. Other versions have the brothers transform into dogs instead of flowers, but the tale remains same. Folk tales popular in North America. Scargo, Princess. Wampanoag Tribe is the author. Scargo Lake, Massachusetts is the location. The legend of Princess Scargo is based on Scargo structure, the first tower built on Scargo Lake by the Toby family. Princess Scargo was the Wampanoag Tribe's sachem's daughter. 
there was no lake in the area during Princess Scargo's reign. She fell in love with a neighboring tribe's warrior. They dispatched the warrior to defend their homeland. He offers Princess Scargo a hollowed-out pumpkin with three little fish inside before leaving. He promises Princess Scargo that he will return before all the fish develop. However, two fish have already died when Princess Scargo receives word of his homecoming. Sachem is concerned about his daughter, seeing her depressed and anxious. He instructs his people to dig, intending to create a vast lake in which the one remaining fish can swim freely. Unfortunately, Princess Scargo learns that her sweetheart has been killed in combat. She sobs on the dry lake, filling it with her tears, before releasing the single fish into the sea. It is reported that the fish's descendants still exist today. Scargo Lake is shaped like a fish. This is most likely due to the legendary folktale that grew up around Princess Scargo's story. While waiting for her sweetheart, Princess Scargo frequently stayed in the original Scargo Tower, viewing the vista. The first tower was made of wood, but the one built by the Toby family was made of cobblestone. Appleseed, Johnny. Unknown author. Location, all across North America. Johnny Appleseed is an intriguing cross between a tall story and a folktale. Tall tales are stories that have gotten so overblown that they no longer match the truth of what happened. Johnny Appleseed was a real historical figure in America. John Chapman is his true name. The genuine narrative of Chapman's exploits in North America is based on his work as a nurseryman. John Chapman was a missionary, a natural movement political leader, and a generous man. He was the first person in Ontario, West Virginia, Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, and Pennsylvania to plant apple trees. Johnny wears torn clothes in the Johnny Appleseed narrative. He was barefoot, wearing a pot on his head, and carrying only apple seeds. Johnny Appleseed casually spread his seeds everywhere he went, resulting in apple trees for the diverse populations of the area he encountered. Johnny Appleseed was reported to be so kind because of his compassionate disposition that he would give the clothing on his back to people who he thought needed it more. His charisma, modesty, and great life made him a suitable role model for many children all over North America. The Mist Maiden. Haudenosaunee is the author. Niagara Falls is the location. The Maid of the Mist is a classic folktale associated with Niagara Falls. It is also one of the popular Native American folktales. It narrates the story of a Seneca girl named Leelawala. According to folklore, Leelawala was bereaved by the loss of her spouse. She was too young to lose him, so she rowed her canoe towards the falls to commit suicide. She began to have misgivings after hearing the noise of the waterfall, realizing that her death would be terrible and slow. Leelawala prays for a quick death to Heno, the god of thunder who lives at the bottom of the falls. Heno rescues Leelawala and marries his son. Heno's grandchild is born to her. One day, Heno informs Leelawala of her people's imminent death due to a huge serpent that intends to poison and eat all of her countrymen. She begs Heno for a chance to warn him, which she accepts. The snake, however, tries to swim upstream, leading Heno to smite it down with thunder. To Heno's chagrin, the snake's body falls just above the falls, forming the massive crescent shape that Niagara Falls now has. As a result, Heno's family relocates to a higher altitude. Babe the Blue Ox and Paul Bunyan. William B. Lawhead is a well-known author. North America and Canada are the locations. Paul Bunyan is the primary figure in many classic folktales and one of the most beloved characters in American folklore. Like Johnny Appleseed, he is frequently depicted in tall stories. Paul Bunyan is a massive lumberjack with tremendous strength. North American loggers pass down his stories verbally. In the 1800s, William B. Lawhead worked as a freelance writer for the Red River Lumber Company, creating stories about Paul Bunyan. The folktales of Paul Bunyan originated with the loggers of the Great Lakes, who then spread the narrative to other loggers. It was also used as a joke against inexperienced lumberjacks at the time. Paul Bunyan was frequently accompanied by Babe the Blue Ox. The majority of his stories revolve around his risky logging experiences and the large markings he and Babe would leave behind, such as footprints. Paul's stories were originally spoken verbally between two loggers as a jest rather than for youngsters. They presented Paul to younger audiences after his print debut. Paul Bunyan was inspired by two individuals, Fabian Fournier and Bon Jean. Fournier was a six-foot-tall logger with a penchant for drinking and brawling. Bon Jean was a French-Canadian lumberman who rose up against the British monarchy. Bunyan is a combined name that translates to Bon Jean's complete name. Pelé's Retaliation. Unknown author. 
Hawaii is the location. The Hawaiian folktale, Pele's Revenge, is about the goddess Pele and her unrequited love for a mortal named Ohia. In this folktale, Ohia was entirely devoted to a woman named Lehua. They were head over heels in love. Pele, on the other hand, spotted Ohia in the forest one day. Ohia politely declined Pele's advances. When Pele sees Ohia and Lehua together, she is filled with jealousy and transforms Ohia into a twisted, unsightly tree. Lehua begs the goddess to turn her beloved back into a person, or she will become a tree as well. Pele's acts enraged the gods above. Instead, they transform Lehua into a flower that blooms above the branches of the Ohia tree until now. The story contains legend as it attempts to explain the Lehua blooms that shoot from the Ohia tree. It is advised in this fable not to pluck a Lehua bloom from the Ohia tree because rain will fall. This is because Lehua does not want to be separated from her spouse. It's a heartbreaking story about unjustly punished victims. The lesson of the narrative is that deeds motivated by wicked ideas will never win. Pele's attempt to separate the couple did not last long, and they were instead forever wedded as long as the Ohia trees bloomed. The Columbia River Coyote. Sahapton tribes wrote this. Columbia River is the location. The tale, The Coyote of Columbia River, is about never requesting too much and becoming greedy, or about the wisdom of a good leader. It came from the Sahapton tribe, who attempted to explain the origins of the Columbia River. The coyote, according to the legend, was a proud animal who wandered throughout the valley when it was only covered by a vast lake. Instead, a long line of mountains stood in its place. The coyote recognized it as the barrier that divided the ocean from the lake. He wanted his people to be able to eat salmon, so he used his skills to build a hole that allowed ocean water to flow into the lake Sakma had his people drain. This created the Columbia River. In other versions of the story, the coyote is thirsty and fatigued from the hot heat. A cloud was brought forth to cover the coyote as shade after he requested it. However, the coyote was not content with simply a cloud. He requests more clouds and rain. He demanded more rain when it began to pour. A small creek grew at his side as a result of the rain. When he requested more rain, it transformed into a large river, sweeping him up and nearly drowning him. He lives but walks away humiliated. The First Tears. Inuit tribes are the authors. Unknown location. The First Tears is an Inuit story, the specific site of which is unclear. All that is known about it is that Native Americans were the first to start telling this story and passing it on to their successors. It's one of those well-known folk tales about the first time humanity learned to cry correctly. The significance of this story is that it teaches individuals how to cry correctly when they are overwhelmed and tired of their sorrow. According to legend, man was once out looking for food. He comes across a group of seals lying on the water's edge. The man was concentrating and crept cautiously up against one of the seals. Unfortunately, the seal he was watching became frightened and withdrew into the water. This procedure was repeated indefinitely. He was trying to catch something to feed his wife and child. It got to the point where only one seal was left sitting by the water's edge. He carefully tried to catch it, but he was unable. The last seal eluded his vision. The man is overcome with an unusual emotion. Water streams from his eyes, and a strange sound comes from his throat as he moves. His child and wife are concerned about his emotions when he returns home. However, when his family learns of his situation, they all cry. This is regarded as the earliest instance of human tears. The Fantastic Wizard of Oz. L. Frank Baum is the author. Kansas City is the location. The Wonderful Wizard of Oz is lovingly known as America's first fairy tale, and it justifiably ranks among America's most popular folk tales. This novel's author created the renowned characters Dorothy, the Tin Man, Scarecrow, the Cowardly Lion, and Toto. The unusual gang of pals flies to Emerald City in order to have the Wizard of Oz grant their wishes. The fairy tale has become one of the most popular stories for children ever written. Dorothy E. Gale gets carried away by a tornado and lands in Munchkinland, where she must travel with three other individuals to Emerald City and find a way back home. All of the characters who accompany Dorothy hope to obtain something they do not have from the Wizard of Oz, the guy who is reputed to grant many wishes. The Tin Man aspires to have a heart. The Scarecrow seeks to become smarter and hence desires a brain. The Cowardly Lion wishes he could be braver. The crew realizes they had what they desired all along while on their risky voyage to the Emerald City and discovering the Wizard of Oz is a phony. 
Dorothy and her beloved dog Toto then seek assistance from Glinda, the Witch of the South. She returns home safely, while her newfound friends finally find homes where they truly belong. The Hunter and Ermine. Cyrus Macmillan is a well-known author. Canada is the location. In Canada, Cyrus Macmillan included Ermine and the Hunter in Canadian Fairy Tales, a collection of popular folk tales. The story is about hunters and their game, as well as mercy for vulnerable animals. It is also a narrative that has an impact on hunting in the North Country, where hunting bear cubs is frowned upon and illegal. The narrative begins with an accomplished hunter who lived with his family in the remote North Country. During the winter, their family would subsist on the game and fishing that the hunter captured for their summer meals. One day, a bunch of bear cubs trespassed and ate their stock. The hunter, enraged, shoots and skins them alive. This incurred the anger of the brown bear of the stony heart, who could not be easily killed. Hunter does his best to beg the clouds, winds, and waves for help. Unfortunately, no one was able to assist him. An old lady appears, and he shows her kindness. This old lady was revealed to be the strange woman of the fairy blue mountains. She teaches him a magic that summons the only animal capable of killing the brown bear of the stony heart. Hunter summons the ermine, who agrees to let him no longer hunt bear cubs in exchange for changing his brown coat into white snow. The brown bear of Stony Heart has been defeated. Meanwhile, the North Country's ermine has stayed pure and white until this day. Popular folk tales from South America. How the Toad Acquired His Bruises. Elsie Spicer Eels is a well-known author. Brazil is the location. How the Toad Got His Bruises is one of many classic Brazilian folk tales. Elsie Spicer Eels, an American folklore scholar, repeated it famously. It's a fable with lessons about taking advantage of others. It also advises you not to invite yourself to parties or activities to which you have not been invited. The toad in this story was formerly gorgeous, with pristine skin. The toad frequently wandered the surroundings, attending parties and interacting with a large number of people. The toad discovered one day that there was going to be a party in the skies. This celebration piqued the toad's interest. How could he, though? He was unable to fly. His pal warns him that it would be folly to even try, but the toad does not listen. Instead, the toad travels to see the buzzard. The buzzard, unlike the toad, was extremely antisocial. The buzzard's favorite instrument was the violin. By crawling into the buzzard's mouth, the toad lures the buzzard into carrying him up into the sky. Unfortunately for the toad, the buzzard returns home after leaving his violin in the sky. The falcon notices the violin and tries to return it to the buzzard, but the toad is too heavy and irritates the falcon, who drops it mid flight. The toad learned its lesson there, covered with bruises, and preferred to stay put. Domingo's cat. Elsie Spicer Eels is a well-known author. Brazil is the location. The South American folktale, Domingo's Cat, teaches children the importance of devotion and kindness. They will never be able to identify the original author of the folktale because it was passed down orally. However, Elsie Spicer Eels, an American folklore researcher, printed Domingo's Cat in Tales of Giants in Brazil. Elsie Spicer Eels assembled a collection of popular Brazilian folktales and folklore, including Domingo's Cat. The story begins with Domingo, a poor man who began selling his possessions in order to survive the day. It gets to the point where his sole companion is his pet cat. He refuses to sell his cat, who eventually thanks Domingo. The cat scavenges for valuable items, giving Domingo half and the remainder to a king. The monarch is persuaded that Domingo is wealthy as a result of the cat's efforts. He then gives Domingo his daughter, the princess. Through cunning and intelligence, the cat fools the monarch into believing Domingo is wealthy. He even swallows a large hole so that his master and his wedded wife might reside in the giant's mansion. Domingo's cat, on the other hand, vanishes. According to mythology, Domingo's cat began hunting for other individuals to help financially. Notable, the rabbit and the coyote Tony Johnston is the author. Location, Juchitan, Oaxaca, Mexico. The Rabbit and the Coyote is a Mexican folktale that originated in Juchitan, Oaxaca. Tony Johnston recounted it and made it into a popular folktale. The moral of this story is to never trust those who are continuously deceiving others. The Rabbit and the Coyote are brothers in this story. The Rabbit frequently plays practical jokes on the poor Coyote. The Rabbit was once leaning on a massive boulder on the side of a valley. The Coyote inquires of the Rabbit as to what his brother was up to. Unfortunately, the rabbit persuades the coyote to hold the boulder because the sky is about to fall. The 
The rabbit even instructs the coyote to keep it in place until he returns with a stick to deposit the boulder in. When the coyote became exhausted, he fell into the ravine. The moon's reflection in the water is noticed by the rabbit. In its imagination, this conjures up a nasty trick. The rabbit instructs the coyote to keep drinking the water in the hopes of reaching the block of cheese, really the moon. Because it could not drink all of the water, the coyote soon becomes ill. The rabbit removes his sandal. Maya tribe broke this. Mexico is the location. The Mayans popularized the folktale, the rabbit throws out his sandal. It has been reissued by numerous authors in various retellings. Elsie Spicer Eels and Denise McGill, in particular. It's a fable about the rabbit's cunning and fast thinking, and how karma punishes evil deads. The vulture that first snatches the rabbit is replaced by a turkey in some tales, and the rabbit is sometimes referred to as the mare. Long ago, all of the creatures coexisted peacefully. They were all housed in a cave, each with their own private chambers divided by holes. Unfortunately for everyone, the rabbit has a habit of duping people. Tired of it, the animals concocted a plot to smash the rabbit with a massive boulder. They drew the rabbit out of its hole, but it was cunning. It was aware that something was awry. Instead of coming out, it informs the other animals that it will not be able to leave until it gets its second sandal. The rabbit requests their assistance, tossing out a sandal for them to find. The vulture catches the sandal, tosses it to the deer, who throws it outdoors. They only discovered afterwards that the sandal they tossed out was actually the rabbit. Frustrated, the group began battling one another, while the rabbit watched from a safe distance. Little Skunk and the Jaguar Tatiana Bacchus of the Maya tribe is a notable author. Brazil is the location. The Jaguar and the Little Skunk is an ancient fable told by Tatiana Bacchus that originated with the Maya tribe. It is a popular folktale that masquerades as a children's story but has a terrible message. The Maya tribe was ruled by the Spanish and the Ladino people. As a result, the Mayans were very careful not to breach any laws imposed by the Spaniards and the Ladinos, because the price for disobedience was frequently their own blood. Little Skunk was reared by Jaguar and Mother Skunk. Jaguar informs Mother Skunk that he will be out hunting and intends to bring Little Skunk with him. Mother Skunk is first concerned, saying that Little Skunk is too young to walk out on his own. Jaguar informs Mother Skunk that he will accompany Little Skunk to teach him some tricks. Little Skunk is ecstatic as Jaguar teaches him how to hunt. They caught a giant antlered animal and had leftovers for their mother to devour. When the meat from their latest hunt was gone, Little Skunk fearlessly told Mother Skunk that Jaguar, his father figure, had taught him how to provide meat. Little Skunk, on the other hand, misjudged his strength and was slain, with Mother Skunk discovering his corpse. The son who is disobedient. Victor Montejo is a well-known author. Jacaltenango, Guatemala is the location. Victor Montejo, a Jacal Tech Maya, is a well-known author around the world. The Disobedient Son is one of the popular folktales he retells in Jacaltenango, Guatemala. It depicts what occurs when you defy your parents or elders. A son fled from his parents in order to live a carefree life. When he became hungry, he came across an elderly guy who lived in a small cabin. The man is aware of his son's hunger and instructs him to cook only 13 beans. These instructions were comprehended by the son, but he felt that 13 beans were insufficient for him and the elderly father. He disobeys and makes a shambles. The elderly man, on the other hand, forgives him and instructs him to retake his instructions and to never enter a room inside his hut. The son meticulously follows the bean recipe, but the door appeals to him. When the son unlocks the door, he finds three enormous water jars and three different colored capes. Clouds emerge from one jar once it is opened. Fearing for his life, the son dons the crimson cloak, which transforms him into a cloud. Fortunately, an elderly man saves him and reintroduces himself as Kitch Mam, the first father of all Zakla who controls the rain and waters from the community fields. Kitch Mam forgives the errant son, who comes home and never disobeys his parents again. The turtle who dances. Pleasant de Spain is a notable author. Brazil is the location. Pleasant de Spain retells one of the more popular folktales, The Dancing Turtle. It is set in a rainforest and was created in Brazil. The story encourages children not to defy their parents and teaches them the turtle's wisdom in difficult times. The narrative begins with a turtle and her flute. She was strolling through the rainforest, playing a wonderful music. A hunter surprised her when she finished her song. 
He brings her home to his family, where he declares that he will make turtle soup out of her. The hunter's two children then cage the turtle, and the hunter instructs his children not to let the turtle out of the cage while he goes to gather more ingredients. Once the hunter was gone, the turtle persuaded the kids to let it out of the cage so they could see her dance while she played the flute. She tells the children after her performance that she is tired and will perform again after a siesta in the shade. The turtle escapes, and the youngsters extend their deception by painting a rock to resemble a turtle's back. The hunter is therefore forced to go hunting again, hoping to find the turtle that deceived his children. The Secret of the Llama Argentina Palacios is a well-known author. Peru is the location. Argentina Palacios retells a folktale called The Llama's Secret in an unusual way. It is a reworked version of two popular folktales. The plot revolves around a family who adores their llama. Even when the father takes the llama to nice grazing spots, the llama suddenly refuses to eat. The father eventually inquires of the llama as to what is bothering it. The llama admits that there will be a tremendous flood and that the family must climb up the hill to avoid the waves. The llama alerts all the other animals it encounters along the journey. The fox first does not trust the llama and dips its tail into the water as it tries to catch up to the group, turning its tail dark. The eclipse begins as they climb the hill, and the animals are concerned about Inti, the sun deity, who may have died. The llama, on the other hand, assures them that Inti is only resting in the vast lake Mamacocha. The two folk tales are a mashup of Palacios tales about a huge flood and a solar eclipse. The Huaroshiri manuscript contains these folk tales. They were first told in print by Francisco de Avila, a Spaniard who wanted to show the presence of American paganism. Folk tales from Australia and Oceania. The Rainbow Bird. Eric Madden is a well-known author. Northern Australia is the location. The Rainbow Bird is an Aboriginal story from Northern Australia. Eric Madden reissued it in 1993, and it has since become one of Australia's most popular folk tales. The plot centers around the discovery of fire and its connection to the rainbow bird. It's also a story about sharing. According to legend, a bird had to eat her meal uncooked and sleep freezing once when Australia was hardly illuminated and chilly. A crocodile had more than enough fire sticks to keep himself warm. The crocodile flatly refused to share when the bird asked. Instead, the crocodile hoarded all of the fire sticks. In response, the bird took to the skies and stole the crocodile's fire sticks. Instead of collecting them all for herself, she dispersed as many fire sticks as she could around the land, giving them to everyone who needed them. As she did so, the flames created beautiful colors on her tail, transforming her into a rainbow bird. Because the crocodile was scared of fire, it had spent its entire life in aquatic marshes. Wayambe the turtle. Authors of note include the Ualari tribes and K. Langlo Parker. South Wales is the location. Wayambe the Turtle is a well-known Australian folktale. K. Langlo Parker, a novelist whose true name is Catherine Eliza Somerville Stowe, repeated it in print. She was noted for her understanding of the stories she heard from the Ualari tribes who were her neighbours during her period. Wayambe the Turtle is one of the stories included in this collection. The story portrays the consequences of impulsive thinking and greed. Kola the Lizard is spotted by Wayambe. She is on a miri flat with her three children, getting yams. Wayambe grabs Kola and tells her that he will look after her and her three children and that she must not resist. Kola agrees grudgingly and is escorted to Wayamba's camp. His tribesmen find Kola was not a gift from the Ula tribe and refuse to aid Wayambe in the impending murder. Wayambe, who is carrying two enormous boreens, is attacked by the Ula tribe. The Ula tribe eventually gets him cornered, and Wayambe dives into the water, never to be seen again. In his place stood a monster with a dull-looking shield on its back. The Ula tribe rationalized it as being Wayambe himself. In the creeks, there was a turtle. Why does a koala have a stumpy tail? Mitch Weiss is a well-known author. Australia is the location. One of Australia's most popular folktales is why koala has a stumpy tail. It is a story about valuable qualities of a person that children and adults should strive towards. The koala's hostility toward his buddies, laziness, and opportunism cost him more than he realized. This story also serves as a warning not to become like the koala. The koala and the tree kangaroo are best friends in the novel. In Australia, there had been a long drought, and the two friends had gotten thirsty and tired of the heat. The tree kangaroo recommended digging a hole to find water. The tree kangaroo excavated as much as he could, never taking a break. 
The koala, on the other hand, was frequently absent and making excuses. When the kangaroo eventually dug up some water, the koala drank it all. The tree kangaroo, enraged, snatched the koala by the tail and tossed him away. As a result, the koala's tail snapped off, and he forever lost his close pal. The Bunyip. Wemba Wemba tribe is the author. Australia is the location. In children's folktales, the Bunyip is a fascinating character. Initially, the Wemba Wemba Aboriginal tribe described the Bunyip as a man-eating shapeshifter. It was a dreadful beast that lived near rivers, lakes, and swamps. The Bunyip would seek for women and children to consume in the evening. It was nocturnal and howled ceaselessly throughout the night. However, by the time European settlers arrived, the Bunyip had come to denote imposter. It evolved into an insult that eventually became a beloved children's book character. The Bunyip's mutation in folk tales and folklore gave birth to a variety of children's stories. Andrew Lang narrated a well-known Bunyip story. It narrates the story of a group of young men who went out on a sunny day to gather food for their tribe. One of the men suggested that they try to catch an eel. Instead of getting an eel, they unintentionally snagged the bunyip cub. The kidnapper refused to give the bunyip cub back to its mother, wanting to impress his lover's younger siblings and parents. The bunyip's fury counted them once the guys felt tranquil, believing they had escaped the bunyip mother. Unfortunately, their punishment cost them their human rights. The bunyip transformed them into black swans and rescued her cub before fleeing to her den. The moral of the story is simple, do not injure children. Uma and Galar. Denise McGill is a well-known author. Australia is the location. The Galar and Ula are popular folk tales that explain the origins of an animal's behavior or appearance. It's all about the Galar's red, spiky skin and Ula's bald head here. It has been reprinted several times, with Denise McGill's most recent fiction representing the letter G in her fairy tale alphabet book. According to the myth, the Galar lizard was swinging his boomerangs back and forth. He was utilizing a shorter and more curved boomerang than the others. This allowed the boomerang to be returned to its original location. Ula passed by and paused to observe the Galar lizard. The Galar lizard added an extra maneuver since he was proud of Ula watching him. The boomerang soared oddly and hit the Ula square in the head, much to the Galar's surprise. Ula began to fear, rushing around with blood on its brow. The Galar, fearing Ula's fright, dashed into the bushes. Ula noticed Galar and proceeded to approach the lizard. It snatched Galar and smeared its blood all over her, making her blood red. Ula cursed Galar, warning the lizard that it would be spiky and red forever as a result of what Galar had done to it. Galar cursed Ula back, stating it would be bald on top of its head forever. It took the burrow and the sun. Jan M. Mike is a well-known author. Australia is the location. The Sun and the Kundaburra is an Australian Aboriginal folk tale. They printed it into books by Jan M. Mike during the 90s. The story is a classic folk tale that explains why an animal behaves the way it does. It's also known as the Kundaburra's laughter. It is a fairy tale that teaches humans to accept all creatures, including those who laugh strangely. The story begins in a time before the sun existed. It was always evening, with only the moon and stars to brighten the sky. The gods above saw the misery of the creatures beneath them. They started a fire and stacked wood so high that they couldn't see the top. The gods constructed a morning star before igniting it, an indication that the sun was about to rise. The animals, on the other hand, were unaware of the morning star. They were overjoyed by the gods' gift of the sun, but there was one more work to complete. The gods had to determine which animal would alert the rest of the world to the sun's coming. The gods determined it should be the Kukaburras laughing when they heard it. The Kukaburra accepted politely. Since then, the Kukaburra has laughed to get everyone up before the sun rises. Elders have warned their younger children not to mock the Kukaburra, or else the sun will not rise. The Victory of the Sea King. Edith Powers is a well-known author. New Zealand is the location. The Sea Victory, Kings is one of the popular Maori folk tales collected by Edith Powers in her book Maryland Fairy Tales. It is a story about the different fish that can be found in the sea and how they gained their bright colors and distinctive features. Its moral lesson is to never dismiss others or their abilities. One day, the sea king hears a woman's cry. The woman he sees tells him about her anguish because her husband left town following their disagreement. The wife is reassured by the sea king that her husband will return. He sent a seagull to deliver the message to the husband. Instead, the husband's buddies mock the sea king. 
the Sea King is enraged after hearing this from the Seagull and summons all of his courageous fishermen to join him in fight. The men on the shore thought it was silly at first, but as the conflict progressed, they became fatigued and injured. When the war was done and the Sea King was victorious, he directed that the woman's spouse return to her side and that the men never forget the might of his strength. The Sea King then grants a wish to each of his courageous fishermen. All of these fish desired to be distinct hues and to have prominent traits. Things they witnessed during the battle this wish was granted by the Sea King, making them unique and lovely underwater. What caused Tiddling to mark? Joanna Trotan is a well-known author. Australia is the location. The Tiddling narrative is a well-known folktale in Australia. It is the genesis story of frogs that can store water within themselves in the event of a drought. It is an aboriginal legend about Tiddling, a greedy gigantic frog, and a platypus who successfully rescues all of the water Tiddling greedily devoured. They have been published in books by Joanna Trotan. Tiddalik is a huge frog who awoke thirsty in this narrative. He drank from the river and then emptied it. Nonetheless, Tiddalik was thirsty, so he drank the lake dry as well. Tiddalik then drank from the billabong's lake, which he also drained. Tiddalik fell asleep after his thirst was satisfied. The bodies of water remained dry in the morning, and all the animals and plants were desperate for water. The old wombat was astute enough to devise a solution. The wombat advised the other animals that they needed to make Tiddalik laugh in order for the water to flow out. All of the animals tried to make him laugh, but it wasn't until the sleeping platypus appeared that Tiddalik actually laughed. This caused all of the water he had ingested to drain from him. The animals appreciated and welcomed the unique platypus, which had no clan due to its unusual behavior and appearance. Tiddalik was the last of the great frogs. However, there are smaller Tiddalik models that can hold water for a dry day. African folktales that are popular. The lion, the ape, and the snake. Unknown author. Tanzania is the location. There are many popular folktales in Africa, but one with no author is The Ape, the Snake, and the Lion, a folktale about man's depravity and the love and knowledge of animals. It's an old story about repaying one's obligation but also being aware of bad characters. M. V. Lana is the main character in this story. Following her husband's death, his mother is the only one who supports him. M. Vu Lana grew up and became a hunter like his father. M. Vu then set traps in which he captured a large number of game. This made it possible for him and his mother to live comfortably. However, the traps eventually stopped working as well as they used to. M. Vu Lana caught the ape, Nini, by chance. The ape begged him to release him and promised to pay M. Vu Lana in exchange. M. Vu Lana consented and released Nini. The snake, Neoka, had the same fate after promising to repay M. Vu Lana. Simba Kongwe, the ancient lion, made a pact with M. Vu Lana as well. A man was captured in M. Vu Lana's trap. M. Vu Lana was advised not to trust man by the animal. Nonetheless, he did so. M. Vu Lana and his mother's appetite was not satisfied, so M. Vu Lana walked deeper into the woods to hunt. M. Vu Lana became disoriented and was rescued by the three animals. However, he was duped by the man he had spared and was nearly executed in front of the sultan. By sitting next to the trickster, Muka, the snake, assisted M. Lana. This compelled the individual to confess his deception to the sultan. The Lion and the Hare Unknown author East Africa is the location. The Hare and the Lion is an East African fable whose exact origins are unknown. It is a story that has been passed down orally from generation to generation. This story's moral emphasizes the superiority of intellect over physical might. Rather than brute force, it appeals to intelligence and wit. In this story, the mighty lion became averse to hunting. He ordered that all of the animals take turns becoming his prey for the day. The animals feared the lion and obeyed his directions with sadness. A hare saw a deep well while cautiously heading towards the lion's den one day. He approached the lion's cave, which was already irritated by the hare's tardiness. The lion demanded to know where the hare had gone, to which the hare replied that he had been attacked by another lion. The lion, pleased with the hare but enraged by another lion in its territory, ordered the hare to lead him to the other lion. When the hare showed the lion the well, the lion mistook his reflection for a threat and pounced, falling into the well and killing himself. The Magic Drum of the King Unknown Author Nigeria is the location. The Magic King's Drum is a Nigerian folklore story. The author of the folktale is unknown because it was passed down orally. The story is about being content with what one has rather than eager for more.
Ephraim Duke is a wealthy monarch who utilized his magical drum to keep invaders and violence at bay. The magical drum could call up a vast banquet, allowing free food to flood into the stomachs of enraged animals and warmongers. The drum, however, bears a curse. When the owner steps on a stick, Egbo men emerge and beat all of the visitors as well as the owner. The tortoise then takes advantage of the situation by taking advantage of one of Ephraim's wives. The tortoise is adamant that Ephraim's wife stole food destined for his children. As a result, Ephraim accepts the drum in exchange. The tortoise boasts about the drum at first, but is beaten after breaking the enchantment. The tortoise then begs Ephraim for forgiveness, and Ephraim grants the tortoise a magical fufu tree that provides one meal per day for the tortoise and his family. However, the tortoise's son becomes hungry and breaks the charm. As a result, the tortoises now reside around the Tai Tai palm because it is their only source of food. The woman in two clothes. Unknown author. Nigeria is the location. The woman with two skins is a love story that originated in Nigeria. It was passed down orally, teaching generations that true love transcends physical appearances. There was a wealthy and powerful monarch once upon a time. He has money, power, and strength. He did not, however, have any children. Despite over 200 spouses, he never had a child. His counselors then advised him to marry the spider's daughter, who laid a lot of eggs. The king concurred. Before they married, the mother spider made her daughter vow not to show the king her other form if he didn't love her. The spider's daughter, in fact, had two skins, one black and hairy, the other perfect and silky. This is what the spider's daughter promised her mother. The monarch eventually fell in love with the spider's daughter, and she exposed her second skin to him. They soon had a large family. The man who never told a lie. Unknown author. Africa is the location. The man who never lied is a popular African folktale whose origins and author have not been determined. The story was passed down orally and is still incorporated in African folklore. Mamad, a smart and truthful man who has never lied, is mentioned in the story. He had become so well known that people from far away had heard of him. The king summoned Mamad one day to see if she was a trustworthy person. Mamad said that he had never lied before. The monarch directed Mamad to inform his wife, the queen, that a feast would be prepared for lunch the following day because the king would arrive at noon. The king and his men intended to arrive late, making Mamad a liar. However, the king realized that Mamad's statements to the queen were solely based on what he had observed, not on what he expected to happen. Mamad informed the queen that the king had informed her that he planned to come at noon and that she should prepare a banquet for lunch. The Lion and the Jackal. Unknown author. Africa is the location. The Lion and the Jackal is a tragic yet well-known folktale about a trusting lion and a cunning jackal. Once upon a time, a lion and a jackal decided to team up and hunt for their families. Because the jackal couldn't hunt as much as the lion, the lion and his family were to perform the majority of the work once the lion had hunted the prey. When the lion went home one day, he discovered his wife and children starving. The lion gets enraged and tries to assault the jackal, who expertly pretends to beat his wife and children, who then weeping as if battered. The lion is concerned for the jackal's wife and children's safety and asks the jackal to halt and instead pull the lion up to the region. However, the jackal and his family cut the rope, causing the lion to be lifted and injured. Hungry, exhausted, and injured, the lion settles for a massive slab of steak instead. Instead of waiting for the feast, the jackal kills the lion with a hot rock covered in meat. The lion eats it but is slain by the hot stone. It's a story about never trusting deals with con artists and constantly keeping an eye on one's family. The Thunder and Lightning Story. Unknown author. Africa is the location. The story of lightning and thunder is an African folktale whose origins are unknown. It tells the story of lightning and thunder, as the name suggests. Thunder was a mother sheep who lived among humans. Lightning, her son, assumed the shape of a ram. When the troublesome lightning became enraged, he would run around the area, burning everything he could get his hands on. Thunder, his mother, would punish him with a loud yell. This frequently irritated the humans, who even protested to the monarch. As a result, the king expelled them from the village, further infuriating lightning. The ram became even more agitated with the villagers, and the mother sheep screamed even louder. The monarch then sought advice from his councils, who encouraged him to exile the mother and boy to the heavens. This is why lightning strikes first and thunder follows. Even more so, why do lightning and thunder strike the clouds? Samba the Fearful. 
Andrew Lang is a well-known author. Africa is the location. Andrew Lang amassed a vast collection of fairy tales from around the world. Samba the Coward was featured in one of his popular folktale compilations. He titled the collection The Olive Fairy Book and published it in 1907. Samba the Coward is the prince of a vast country in this folktale, but he is often taunted for being a cowardly boy. The monarch had hoped that as Samba grew older, he would change, but Samba remained fearful of practically everything. Samba marries a princess from another realm in the end. His body had grown to be massive and robust. When the Moors arrived to invade the princess's realm, Samba chose to hide rather than lead the army. This compelled the princess to fight twice with Samba's armor, concealing her husband's timidity. Samba is eventually compelled to fight for the third time when the invasion forces him to combat without warning. This inspired Samba to fight boldly, and the kingdom triumphed every time. Samba then reveals to the people and the king that the princess, not him, earned their triumph. Samba was then transformed into a very brave man. Conclusion. We hope you liked learning about popular folktales, including both fables and unique fairy tales. They not only hold characteristics that most of us would want to inculcate in our children, but they also connect us to our forefathers. Stories live on. Instead, they are continually transforming into something else. You become a part of the tradition when you learn about popular folktales. Even if you only wanted to learn new stories and push yourself beyond your comfort zone, with no intention of passing it on, you'll learn a thing or two. We are confident that these stories will not fade away anytime soon. We can, however, guarantee that there will be more to study and read about. Hopefully, our future will be filled with more amazing folktales from all cultures and locations. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to our channel, since we will be covering a lot of similar content in the future. Till next time, stay curious.